O Lord, who for our sake did fast 40 days and 40 nights, give us that kind of discipline, we pray that our lives, our flesh and minds may be subdued by your spirit and word, that we may ever obey thy godly motions and directions to thy honor and glory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, we return to Dr. Millard Erickson's Christian Theology, Chapter 3, Method of Theology. We've been describing here the process and uh, we'll pick it up here on page 75. What we are calling here is not to make the message acceptable to all, particularly those who are rooted in secular assumptions. There is an element of the message of Jesus Christ that will always be a scandal or offense. The gospel, for example, <clears throat> requires a surrender of the autonomy to which we tend to cling so tend to cling so tenaciously no matter what age we live in How about romans 8 7 here uh, millard the aim then is not to make the message acceptable to, to make sure as far as possible that the message is at least understood It'll be interesting to see how he handles the noetic effect of sin a number of themes will be present present themselves as fruitful for our exploration as we form a contemporary expression of the message. Although our age seems increasingly characterized by depersonalization and detachment, there are real indications of a real craving for a personal dimension in life to which the doctrine of God who knows and cares about each one can profitably be related. And although there is a type of confidence that modern technology could solve the problems of the world, there are growing indications of an awareness that problems are much larger and more frightening than realized that man's greatest problem <clears throat> to himself. Against this backdrop, the power and providence of God have a new pertinence in addition to a different cast to our theology which may enable us to face the questions which it does not want to ask, but must ask. Today it is popular to speak of contextualizing the message <clears throat> because the message originally was expressed in a contextualized form. It must be decontextualized. The essence of the doctrine must be found. Then, however, it must be recontextualized in three dimensions. First, we may infer as to length involving the transition from a first century setting to a 20th century setting. We've already made mention of this. The second dimension is that we might refer to as breadth. At a given time period, there are many different cultures. It's been customary to observe the difference between the East and the West. The note that Christianity, while preserving its essence, may take on somewhat different forms of expressions in different settings. Some institutions have disregarded this, and the result has been a ludicrous exportation of Western customs. For example, little white chapels with spires were sometimes built for Christian worship in the Orient, just as church architecture may appropriately take on forms indigenous to a given part of the world, so may also the doctrines. We're striving for the holy Catholic apostolic reformed faith. We are becoming increasingly aware that the most significant dis distinction culturally may be between the North and South rather than the East and West, as the third world becomes especially prominent. This may be important to Christianity as its rapid growth in places like America, Africa shifts the balance from traditional centers in North America and at Europe. Missions and especially cross-cultural studies are keenly aware of this dimension of the contextualization process. There's also a dimension of height. 
theology may be dealt with on varying levels of abstraction, complexity, and sophistication. We may think of this as a ladder with rungs from top to bottom. On the top level are the theological superstars. These are the outstanding thinkers who make profoundly insightful and innovative breakthroughs in theology. Here are the Augustines, Calvin, Schleiermachers, and Barts. In some cases, they do not work out all the details of their theological system, which they found that they begin the process not historically conscious to my so far. Their writings are compulsory reading to the large number of professional theologians who are one level below. All these ordinary theologians admire the superstars on the top level and aspire to join them. Most of them will never become part of that select group. On the next rung down are students in theological schools and per persons engaged in the practice of ministry. While they study theology with the competence that is only one part of their commitment. Consequently, their understanding of theology is less thorough and penetrating than those who devote full time to its study. On lower rungs of the ladder are laypersons, those who never studied theology in a formal setting. Here, several levels of theological literacy will be found. Various factors determine where each layperson stands on the ladder. The amount of background in biblical study, it's in church or Sunday school, chronological age or maturity, the number of years of formal education. True contextualization of the message means that it will be capable of being expressed at each of these levels. Most persons in ministry will be called upon to interpret the message at a level about one step below where they are personally. They should also try to study some theology at least one step above their position in order to remain intellectually alive and growing. Development of a central interpretive motif. Each theologian must decide upon a particular theme which for him is the most significant and helpful in approaching theology as a whole. Considerable differences will be found among leading thinkers in terms of the basic idea that characterizes their approach. For example, many see Luther's theology as centering on salvation by grace through faith. Calvin seemed to make the sovereignty of God basic to his theology. Karl Barth emphasized the word of God by which he meant the living word, Jesus Christ. As a result, some have characterized this theology as Christomonism. Paul Tillich made much of the ground of being. Nels Ferrer and the Ludensian school of Swedish thinkers, such as Anders Nygren and Gustav Alum, made the love of God central. Oscar Kullman stressed the already, but not yet. There is a need for each theologian to formulate such a central motif. It will lend unity to his system and thus power to his communication of it. I was once taught in an introductory speech course that just as a basket has a handle by which it can be picked up, so a speech should have a central proposition or thesis by which the whole can be grasped and in terms of which the whole can be understood. Metaphor applies equally to theology. There is also the fact that a central motif in one's theology will give basic emphasis or thrust to his ministry. One might think the central motif as a perspective from which the date of theology are viewed the perspectives does not affect what the data are, but gives a particular angle or cast to the way in which they are viewed. <clears throat> Just as standing at a particular elevation or location often enables us to perceive an integrative motif that will give us more understanding of the theological data. It could be argued that any theology which has coherence 
as an integrating motif. <clears throat> it can also be argued that sometimes there may be more than one motif, and these may be somewhat contradictory in nature. What is being pled here is for conscious and competent choice and use of the integrating motif. Care must be exercised lest this become a hindering rather than facilitating factor. Our central must motif must never determine our interpretation of the passages where it's not relevant. This would be a case of asegesis rather than exegesis. Even if we hold the already but not yet as a key to Christian doctrine, we should not expect that every passage is to be understood as eschatological and find eschatology under every bush in the New Testament. Nevertheless, the potential abuse of a central interpretive motif should not deter us from making a legitimate application of it. The integrative motif may have to be adjusted as part of the contextualization of one's theology. It may be well that at a different time or different cultural and geographical setting, one's theology should be organized on a somewhat different fulcrum. This is true where a major element in the milieu calls for a different orientation. For example, one structures one's theology somewhat differently in an antinomian than in a legalistic atmosphere. By basing our central motif on the broadest range of biblical materials rather than on personal selected passages, we can make sure that our motif will not distort theology. The result may be somewhat broad in a general motif, but we'll be assured it is truly comprehensive. The central motif around which theology will be developed in this writing is the magnificence of God. By this is meant the greatness of God in terms of power, knowledge, and other traditional natural attributes as the excellence and splendor of his moral nature. Theology will like be centered on the great living God rather than upon man, the creature, because God is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. It is appropriate that our theology be constructed with his goodness and greatness as the primary reference. A fresh vision of the magnificence of the Lord is all of all is the source of vitality that should pervade the Christian life. Magnificence here is to be understood as encompassing what has traditionally been associated with the glory of God, without the connotation of self-centeredness sometimes carried by that expression. Number nine, stratification of the subjects. The final step in the theological message is to arrange the basis topics on the basis of their relevant relative importance. That is, in effect, to say we need to outline our theology, assigning a Roman numeral to the major topics, capital letter to subtopics, an Arabic numeral to topics subordinate to the subtopics, and so on. We need to know what the major issues are. We need to know what can be treated as subtopics, that is, which is, which are issues, while important, are not quite crucial and indispensable as are the major divisions. For example, eschatology is a major area of doctrinal investigation. Within that area, the second coming is the major belief rather less crucial and considerably less clearly taught in scripture is whether the church <clears throat> will be removed from the world before or after the great tribulation. Ranging these topics on the basis of their magnitude should help us expending major amounts of time on energy, which is of secondary or tertiary importance. Once this is done, there will also be a need to be some evaluation even of the topics which are on the same outline. While they have equal status, there are some which are more basic than others. For example, the doctrine of scripture affects all other doctrines since they are derived from scripture. 
Further, the doctrine of God deserves special attention because it tends to form, tends to form, tends to form, he says, the framework within which all other doctrines are considered that is poor. The modification here will make a considerable difference in the formulation of other doctrines. Finally, we need to note that at a particular time, one doctrine may need more attention than another. Thus, while we would not want to assert that one doctrine is superior to another in some absolute sense, we conclude that at this point in time, one of them is of greater significance to the total theological and even ecclesiastical enterprise. Degrees of authority of theological sentiments our theology will consist of various types of theological statements which can be based, classified on the basis of their derivation. It is important to attribute to each statement an appropriate, appropriate degrees of authority. Direct statements of scripture are to be accorded with the greatest weight to the degree that they accurately represent what the Bible teaches. Here they have the status of the direct word from God. Great care must, of course, be exercised to make certain that we are dealing here with the teaching of Scripture and not an interpretation imposed on it. Two, direct implications of Scripture must also be given high priority. They are to be regarded slightly as less authoritative than direct statements, however, because the introduction of an additional step, logical inference, carries with it the possibility of interpretational error. Three, probable implications of scripture, that is inferences that are drawn in cases where one of the assumptions or premises is only probable or somewhat less authoritative. Number four, inductive conclusions from scriptures vary in the degree of authority. Inductive investigation, of course, gives only probabilities. <clears throat> the certainty of its conclusion increases as the proportion between the number of references actually considered and the total of pertinent references which could conceivably considered increases. Conclusions inferred from general revelation which is less particularized and less explicit than special revelation must accordingly always be subject to a clearer and more explicit statements of the Bible. Six, outright speculation, which frequently include hypotheses based upon a single statement or a hint in scripture, or derived from somewhat obscure and unclear parts of the Bible, may also be stated and utilized by theologians. There's no harm in this as long as the theologian is aware and warns the reader of what he's doing. A serious problem enters if these speculations are presented with the same degree of authority as attributed to direct statements in the first category. The theologian will want to employ all of the legitimate material available, giving it each, in each case, neither more or less credence in his appropriate view of the nature of the sources. Not a word about the confessions, the creeds, the liturgies, the traditions, the writings of church history. Very atomized, individualized, Americanistic, if not Baptistic. Most of it we agree with, but he has some self limitations here. We love him, but we have our criticisms as well. Let's close this. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and Holy Ghost.